acting up a little bit up here. If they're not careful. Mommy's going to reward them according to their works. <laughs> Amen. Let's go ahead and take our Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. I've been out of Proverbs for a while teaching other sermons, but I'm trying to get back into the book of Proverbs, teaching through the book, preaching through the book. It might be a little of both, or it might be more of one than the other. Proverbs chapter 6. We'll pick it up in verse 12. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Forwardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, he that soweth discord among the brethren. Uh, Brother Rod, will you ask the Lord to bless the evening? Amen. As we look at our text here, we need to remember that Solomon speaking to his son Rehoboam, giving him uh, advice in us uh, laying on him some knowledge that he may get some understanding and apply some wisdom to his life. In uh, speaking to Rehoboam, he's, he's, uh, he's warning him against the wicked man. Now, we live in a wicked world. Now, as the preacher preached this morning, this world is not our home. If you're saved, you're a pilgrim. You're just passing through. You're a stranger. You're a pilgrim. Uh, you ought to be strange to this world. Now, this, like I said, this is a wicked world that we live in. It's full of darkness and wickedness, and yet you got to dwell here, and the Lord's put you here. You know, it's an amazing thing after a person gets saved, you would think, man, uh, wouldn't, in just a, uh, in our view of how things ought to work, is when you get saved, the Lord just whoop, pulls you on out of there now. Whoop, okay, you got saved, he pulls you out. No, he doesn't, though. The Lord doesn't do that. The Lord leaves you here and amongst this wickedness. Now, what you're supposed to do as a Christian is to live a, a separate life life in the midst of a wicked nation in a wicked world. And that is a struggle. That is a fight. Now back here in our text in verse 12 it says, a naughty person. A naughty person. Now that's a neat thing. It goes down further and you see the word mischief show up. Now generally when you hear those words naughty and mischief is generally addressed toward a child. So you've been a very naughty boy today. You've been, uh, uh, you've been into a lot of mischief. He's very mischievous that child is. And oftentimes you hear those addressed to children. But that's going to be uh, just a, a reflection of how the world uses the Word of God and tries to downplay those things that the Lord said is a gross uh, thing before His eyes. Uh, that word naughty is a nasty, it's a bad deal. You ought not be a naughty Christian. Uh, you, ought, you ought not be a mischievous Christian. Uh, God is opposed to those things. That's the, I could get an amen out of that. Some of you, maybe you're thinking there's nothing wrong with being a little naughty, being a little mischievous, like it's a funny in a character. God don't like it. It's wrong. It's only used three times, this word naughty, in your King James Bible. Now, Webster describes it as a word of someone who behaves badly. They're disobedient. They're a rebel. And that's what I was before I got saved. I was a rebel. I rebelled against what uh, instructors over me. I rebelled against my teachers. I rebelled against my parents. I rebelled against God. You ought not be a naughty person. You ought not be a rebel. These young boys in here, you ought not be rebels against your father. You ought not be rebels against your mother. You ought to obey the Word of God. Ought not be naughty. That's not a good term. That's not a good phrase. It's not something good to be hanging over your head as a sign. 
Now these three cases we see here in our text, this, uh, these three times is used, it's also used over in the book of Proverbs. Uh, we'll look at that, Proverbs 17, verse 4. Look over at 17. Proverbs 17. Look at verse 4. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. So we look at that verse closely there, and it's saying uh, the naughty feeds the liar, and the liar feeds the wicked doer. So the naughty is just as wrong as the doer. You see that thing? And it's a neat thing that you're going to see here in this text, well, not necessarily neat, but something that's going to be uh, continual here is the issue of your mouth, the issue of your lips, the issue of your tongue. No other body part is mentioned more often in your text, in your Bible, laying in your laps right now, that pertains, uh, it's, it's your lips and your tongue. That's a big problem with you. Now I say that, speaking to myself also, <laughs> as I'm sitting there writing these things and typing these things up on the paper, the Lord's saying, that's you, Barney. That's your stinking mouth. Those are your lips. Now what's a, uh, a funny thing to me, I suppose, is the fact that I shoot my mouth off uh, here at this church more than most folks. The pastor shoots his mouth off more than me. What we do, we stand behind this pulpit, and I stand behind this pulpit, and we talk. There's a danger in opening your mouth. You know, people say sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Oh, yeah, they will. Words will split up your marriage, will split up your home, will separate you from your church, will mess you up at a job, will get you fired, will get you arrested. Sure, words will do plenty of damage. There's more people who have left this church and are out of church and not going to any church because of words that someone has said to them. Has nothing to do with the Word of God. No dispensational issues or, or something or disagreements on, on where things apply and who preached what and, and who wrote what book or anything. Nothing to do with doctrinal things at all. Somebody hurt my feelings. The title of this tonight is Beware the Wicked Man. And brethren, I'm here to tell you the wicked man very often is the guy you see in the mirror. Beware that wicked man. He's the one, he's the tongue you gotta that you gotta watch out for. Those are the lips you better watch. You stay here long enough, you're gonna hear me say something wrong. You stay here long enough, you're gonna hear the pastor say something wrong. It's gonna happen. Why these fleshy lips are no good. <laughs> you gotta beware the wicked man, the naughty person. Solomon speaks to his son. Why? He doesn't want his son to run into those troubles. He wants his son to understand the issues and the fights and the worries and the things he's going to run into. You're going to run into a wicked man. The next place that word naughty shows up, it shows, over, shows up in the book of Jeremiah. We can turn over there. Jeremiah chapter 24. Beware the naughty person. Jeremiah 24. Look at verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carried away captive uh, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the princes of Judah, and the carpenters and the smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them uh, to Babylon. The one basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were, they were so bad. Now look at the next verse. <laughs> then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that could not be eaten. They are so evil. So what is being naughty connected to something that's rotten and evil? You, brother, you got a naughty tongue? Is it rotten? Is it evil? You better watch your words. Watch your words. 
Now we looked at it before back in our text, Proverbs chapter 6. I'm not meaning to sound mean tonight. This was a more uplifting message when I was working on it. <laughs> Amen. It, it, it gets that way sometimes. Proverbs chapter 6, back in verse 14. Well, we'll look in verse 13. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Solomon saying that's how you can recognize this wicked man, son. You see some of his attributes and some of the things that uh, come to pass by his ways. Verse 14, forwardness is in his heart. Forwardness is in his heart. He devises mischief continually. There's that word mischief. Finding trouble. What is mischief defined as is playful misbehavior or troublemaking, especially in children. You know, like I said, we often hear both of these words, naughty and mischievous, connected to children. But these words are downplayed in our culture. They're wicked words. That's a wicked thing to go, oh, he's a very mischievous child. And I understand what they say. I've said it about my boy. Boy, it says, son, you're being very mischievous. Why? He's trying to find trouble. He's trying to pick at something he ought not be picking at. He'll go pick up a toy in the back room in there that he knows his brother likes and will bring it and play in front of, it, in front of his brother and tempt his brother to desire. Little Bradley, he wants to take that toy and play with it. No, I had it first. And I bring Levi to me. I say, Levi, how come you wasn't content playing with that toy back there? How come you brought it? And making him think about what he was doing. I said, you, just, you chose to bring it out here in front of someone to tempt him. And then called him out on an action that he did based upon what you started. You know, and that's how we Christians are sometimes, us brethren, will say a certain thing in front of someone just to see how they respond. Well, I can't control their mouth. I can't control their thoughts. Well, why would you say what you say? You wanted a response. Get a little dig in there. I've had it done to me, coming out of the pulpit or, or just sitting around some folks and someone say something. Think, well, why did they say that? Why did they say that? Mischievousness. Naughtiness. Watch your words. Watch your words. Watch your ears. Now, you can't control, like I said, you can't control the wicked man, the naughty person, or the mischievous Christian. But what you can do, you can control yourself when you hear those things. I remember right after I got saved, I'd only been saved a year or so, and I started going to a church uh, down south in Alabama, and I remember being in there, and I was very, very harsh. Just the things I thought about things. Well, if you believe that way, then you're just an idiot. You're just stupid. You're just dumb. You know, that's a dumb thing to think. You ought to get right on this. And I was very direct and crude about it. I was right. I didn't say I was wrong about some things. I'm not trying to be arrogant right now. There were some things. I, I was right on it. But the way I brought about it was very naughty. Very arrogantly. Do you know what I had to learn to do? I had to learn to watch my mouth. Because what I thought was talking to people, well, they need to be set straight. No, those were God's people that needed a chance to grow and needed some grace. Haven't you said something stupid every once in a while? I mean, really, haven't you said something? You look back and you can't, oh, I can't believe I said that. That's so embarrassing. That was so dumb. I've said, man, I say it back time and time again. I don't have to look back very far in my past. If you stand up here very long enough, you're going to say something like, why did I say it like that? Why did I say that? But you better learn to watch your words, and you better watch your ears how you perceive. Like I said, you can't control that wicked man who is speaking to you, or that naughty person, or that mischievous person, but you can control your response. You know, I know, I know some of you personally know some of you better than others, and I know if I come up to you and just look right at you and say, uh, I think you're an idiot. I'm probably going to get popped. <laughs> I'm probably going to get pushed or get put in my place really quickly. And I know some of you very well. I come up and say, I think you're just an idiot. You're like, all right. And you're just, they're just going to keep on walking. Now, what's the difference there? Like, okay. It's all right for someone. Let somebody say something. Let some people be ignorant for a while. Give somebody grace to be foolish. 
Like, oh, all right, okay. I've had to do that with several other brethren. They come up and they say something about the preaching or, or something and just, okay. Just keep on going. You don't have to fight every fight. You're not called to fight every fight. You're, fought, you're called to fight the right fight. I don't want to hurt people anymore. I don't want to hurt nobody with my words. Why? Because the Lord has pointed out saying, those are my sheep. Those are my people. And I want you to love them. And I want you to treat them right. You know, sometimes the sheep, they do things that are foolish. I know Brother Shahan, he, he can attest to that. Well, they'll run into you. They don't mind standing on your toes. They don't mind knocking you down, trying to get that bucket of feed that's in your hand. But what you do, you give them a chance to grow. Hope I'm saying something that's making sense to you tonight. <laughs> Amen. All right. You know, we often talk about these words, like I was saying, these words that are, um, are brought down and minimized, you know, these naughty and this mischievous. You better watch that. You better watch that. Uh, is a good example of, um, well, let's, let's continue on. Take back to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Now, these eight verses that we're looking at here tonight, uh, they can pertain to three different people. Like I said, I think I would title this probably, Beware of the Wicked Man. Uh, but there's several wicked men addressed in your Bible. Now, the wicked man that we can look at here in our text uh, has to do, the, one of the men has to do with the Antichrist. You can see it there in, in verse 13. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers, forwardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Now what that is, that's a reference to the Antichrist. Now you can see that uh, all through Revelation chapter 13, and you can see it over in uh, Psalms 52. Let's look at Psalms 52. You know, I was fellowshipping with the pastor today, and we were sitting around a table just talking about uh, illustrations of funny things our children have said. And they're just ridiculous things, just off the wall crazy things. And we laugh about it. And, uh, but it, the things we laughed about and talked about, they wouldn't be funny if our children were in their 20s and 30s. You know, and that's something uh, you need to have some grace with some Christians who are younger Christians, who have been saved very long or fresh out of the world. Give them liberty, and it's all right because one day in the back of your mind, you're, they're going to grow up one day. I've had several older Christians that have watched me since I've been saved to, to where I am now, and, and i got to look back like, wow, they had a lot of grace with me. They had a lot of grace with me. They allowed me to sit there and, and spout off my mouth of some very foolishness, and they just looked at me and smiled and said, well, all right. And I look back now, and I'm thinking, they could have they nailed me on that hard. So you got to watch that. you got to watch trying to nail somebody to the wall. Just because you got a hammer don't mean you got to nail somebody to the wall with it. All right. Psalms 52. Why boastest thou of thyself in mischief? There it is, O mighty man. The goodness of God endureth continually. The tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. What does it do? The tongue cuts and it hurts. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Salah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. There it is, without remedy. It's a reference to the Antichrist. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. So what is that? That's a mischievous tongue. That's what the devil has. He has a split tongue. Um, you ought not be known to have something in common with the devil. A sharp tongue. 
a mischievous tongue, a naughty tongue. Like I said earlier, how that tongue operates and how it works, where the naughty tongue feeds the liar and the liar feeds the wicked doer. What is it? It's a domino effect. Your words will go out and they'll hurt. They'll do damage. We could go all night looking at verses of the tongue and the tongue and the tongue. And tomorrow we're going to wake up and we're still going to open our mouth and say something foolish. You better guard that tongue. And how do you guard that tongue? You guard that heart. All right, so we see that one of these individuals, this wicked man back in Proverbs chapter 6, uh, the Antichrist, and we can see that uh, this uh, wicked man can also be a lost man. Most places you're going to find in your Bible that pertain to the wicked has to do with a person that is separated from God that is lost, is dealing with a lost individual uh, who hates God. Now, now, also, there's the third man, and what, who that is, that's the backslidden Christian. A backslidden Christian can be a very wicked man, can be wicked in his ways and in his doings. Either or, this wicked man, Solomon is saying to Rehoboam, beware of the wicked man. Beware of that wicked man. Uh, now, firstly, Solomon, he gives a description of this wicked man. Verse 12, it says, he is forward in his mouth. His mouth uh, creates division. Creates division. Well, did you hear what that preacher said about the verse over there in John? He said it meant this. I said, isn't that kind of self-righteous? I mean, isn't that kind of wrong? Well, if you feel that way, why didn't you go ask the pastor about it? Well, we need to pray for the pastor and his wife. You know, you know, there's something going on in that house. I don't know what it is yet, but we need to pray for them. Why, do, why, do, why are you saying that? Well, those little words. What is that? That's a serpent getting in there. Watch that tongue. Watch that tongue. They're forward, forward in their mouth, in their tongue. You know, like I said, most people who leave church and get out of church and get away from God, they're offended by something someone has said. I don't want anybody to leave because of something I might have said in the flesh. Something that I might have said that was foolish. Now, like I said, I'm going to make mistakes and mess up and say things that aren't just quite right. And if I have and if I've offended you, I'm sorry. I don't want to hurt nobody. But let me tell you, brother, and if... Uh, You've been offended by some things that have been preached from this Bible and it's straight doctrine, then praise the Lord. I'm okay with this book offending you. I'm not okay with my carnality and my fleshly tongue hurting you. And you ought to be that way uh, with your brethren. You ought not try to hurt the brethren. You're supposed to be helping the brethren. There's few of us. There's more of the world than there is of us, guys. <laughs> we need every one of us we can get. You better be encouraging the brethren. Now the froward mouth loves to gossip and spread rumors and create trouble and controversy. Now what is this? This is a wicked person. That's a wicked man. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, look at 27. A violent man, where am I at there? Let's see. 27. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. You ever heard somebody say they're digging, they're trying to dig up dirt on somebody? That, that's where they get it. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. You trying to dig up dirt on somebody? Well, tell me, well, tell me something about that guy. Well, what's going on there? And as soon as you hear that click, let me call so and so. I bet they didn't know that. We've been wondering. We figured about them. Digging up, digging up dirt. I've heard an old preacher say one time, and it's pretty harsh. Some of you women can get more dirt out of a, a telephone than you can a vacuum cleaner. That's harsh, isn't it? <laughs> Some other preacher said that. I wouldn't say something like that. 
Proverbs. That's funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> back, in, back here in our text. The ungodly man diggeth up evil in his lips. There is a burning fire. Now, someone who likes to play with fire, what are they called? They're called a pyromaniac. They like to see things burn. Now, what is it? A person that burns down someone's house for insurance money? That's a narcissist. Or what? Not a narcissist. It's a arsonist. I knew it was a cyst. <laughs> it's an arsonist. Now, what they'll do, they'll burn down a house so they can get insurance money and there's value, something they can get from it. But a pyromaniac, they do it just because they like to see something burn. Now, consider the words that come out of your mouth. Are they coming out as an arsonist? Are they coming out as a pyromaniac? Or how are they coming out? You just want to see a family burn? Well, I've seen your, seen your husband today up at the store. He was talking to some gal up there. It was, I don't know what they were talking about. Okay. <laughs> what was that all about? You say, people don't say, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I'm thankful. You know, I can be thankful I, we got rid of the, I had Facebook and I got, I just started to see one thing after another and like, what are you alluding to? I'm reading their words and things that they're saying, like, what are you implying here? And before you know it, you're looking and you're thinking, you see somebody in town, you're thinking, I remember that thing they posted, that's weird, what's going on there? And all of a sudden, you know more than you want to know. Or they give you just enough information to make you wonder and you just, man, just got to get out of this thing. I got rid of that mess. My wife has it, and she keeps up with our family down south and what's going on, and, and her and the pastor are getting the uh, things going on with the church and stuff like that and posting sermons and to that nature. And see, I don't do none of that because, you know, they, they know better than put those things in my hands. I'll delete everything accidentally. So I just got out of it. What is that? That Facebook, that YouTube, and that Twitter, and all this stuff. Social media. Why do you need to be on that? They say they're going to combine Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and make one thing so they can just have it all in one spot. They're going to call it You Twit Face. <laughs> so I finally got a laugh out of y'all. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> y'all kind of tight tonight. Everybody okay? <laughs> it's a tough crowd, brother. <laughs> So we're going to look at these eight things here in this text here. It talks about the forward mouth loves to gossip and spread these rumors. Now back in our, we're looking at Proverbs 16 here, um, verse 30. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 30. You ought to put a star beside it. It said, He shutteth his eyes to devise forward things. What is that? That's his imaginations. He's sitting there and he's dwelling on it. He's meditating on it. He's considering it in his own mind and in his heart. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. Man, ain't that a creepy dark verse? That's creepy. You know why it's creepy? I see myself in it. He shutteth his eyes, devise forward things. And the issue I want to look at here is we're looking at in Proverbs chapter 6, back in our text, there's the verse there talking about in verse 13, chapter 6, verse 13, He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers, forwardness is in his heart, devises mischief continually. Talking about those things, his fingers, his feet, his eyes. But you know what? The evil man... Those are just the outward things that we see. We, we consider people wicked based upon what we see. We watch on the news and we see these protests of people breaking these storefront windows and grabbing jewelry and shoes and, and they're running off with it. We consider that's a wicked individual. We watch the news and we see uh, abortion clinics and these different things saying, well, that's just a wicked thing they're doing there. And, and uh, we look at all these wicked this wickedness, and we base wickedness upon what we see and what we perceive. And it's an amazing thing what the Lord bases wickedness upon. Look at the first time wickedness shows up in your Bible. Turn over to Genesis chapter 6. The first time the, the word wickedness shows up, something wicked, or is spoken of specifically.
Look at verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. As I said, we look on the outward outpouring of wickedness, and we see the wickedness done with the hands and with the feet and with the eyes, and, and we see just uh, people doing wickedness, uh, visually seeing it. The Lord looks upon the heart, remember? Now, some of you are very clean on the outside, but you're wicked and full of dead men's bones on the inside. The Lord is considering, and, and right here talking about going to destroy the earth with a, with a flood based upon the imaginations and the thoughts of the heart. You better watch your heart. Guard your heart. Imaginations, thoughts, and the heart. That's what makes a wicked man. He's got an unbridled heart. It's just free to love and to consider and to imagine and to dwell on and to pack full of evil. You better watch your heart. You know, uh, we say this is kind of common sense stuff I'm saying to you. But I know you and I know me. That's what we do. We look at the brethren and saying, well, at least I'm not doing that. Well, look at them. They're just shacking up. Well, look what they're doing. They're just doing this. Well, look how they're living over there. He left his wife for so-and-so. Look at what. Why do you collect those thoughts to justify your inner wicked man? That's why you do that. It's good to notice what wickedness is and to recognize it. And to label it, and to, I, I believe in that. Comparing it with uh, scripture, with scripture, and, and looking at it, and comparing it with the book, and finding out if it's right or if it's not, and determining if it's wicked. You should do that, but you ought to do that with yourself. Bring every thought and imagination into the captivity of Jesus Christ. Look at Proverbs twenty-three, verse seven. For he that thinketh in his heart, so is he. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. You are what you eat. <laughs> you are what you devour. And you'll become that wicked man. That's one thing, if you get anything out of anything I said tonight, is to beware the wicked man in the mirror. Beware of that wicked man. Look over at Proverbs, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Here's the Lord considering the inner man. Pro, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You see what has happened in the heart? The Lord says you're an adulteress. Now we don't consider someone that if they just look. You see how the Lord's interested in the inner man? In the thoughts of the inner man. And brethren, that's your fight. Your fight is with the inner man, the carnal man, putting off the old man, and putting off the old man, and putting off the old man. But there's more to it. There's putting on the new man. Brethren, I'm here to tell you, you can put off the old man and separate from the world and stop drinking, stop smoking, stop hanging out with those who do. Uh, make sure you don't cuss. You, you don't uh, uh, do a lot of the wickedness that the world does. Don't have color TV in the house. That's what they used to say in the 60s. I think we ain't even, you know, you shouldn't have color TV in the house. <laughs> 
you can separate from all those things and put off that old nature as much as you want to, but until you put on that new nature, you have done no good. You've got to put on that new nature. All right, back in our text in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6. I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop right there because i got a whole other deal on this, these guys right here. But we'll read it. We'll look at it. These six things doth the Lord hate. Well, no way, not the Lord. The Lord doesn't hate, would He? Surely the Lord wouldn't hate something. That's so negative. We serve a positive God. He loves everybody. And He loves everything. And, you know, if you're going to be a good gardener, you better hate weeds. <laughs> If you're going to love righteousness, you better abhor unrighteousness and wickedness. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And we'll pick up on that next time. We'll go ahead and we'll stop right there. We'll close in prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you.